Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Food, Wine, and Whiskey. I am Rob, your host. Looking forward to a fun conversation today. I have a fantastic guest. My guest this evening is Agnes of the YouTube channel, No Sediment. Agnes, how are you doing today? Hi, how are you? I'm doing Uh, fine. I'm doing well, and I want to say thank you very much for coming on and having a conversation with me. I've been a fan of your channel for quite some time. I actually found you. Um, you were a guest on my, Matthew Horky's channel who had popped up in my, and ever since I saw you on his channel, I went over to yours. I subscribed right away and, and I enjoy your, your weekly videos and you have a fantastic co-star. Oh, <laughs> dog, <laughs> the dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And I guess I also have to say thanks to Matthew as well, because he was the one who invited me to do that video together with him. Yeah, it was a fun video you all did, but uh, your, your channel is fantastic. And, you know, I don't want to be the one to talk about your channel. You're, you're, you would be more uh, the person to, to talk about that. Tell us about your channel, No Sediment. Tell us about, you know, kind of why you decided to start this channel and, and kind of what, what, what do you, uh, what's the vision for the channel? Um, I guess that would, could probably be a better question for my husband <laughs> because uh, he has way better vision when it when it comes like he has like aims and, and goals to to go for uh, when it comes when it when it, when we are talking about the no sediment YouTube channel. But for me, I actually started to do it as part of my studies because I enrolled in Institute of Masters of Wine and uh, study program, and I thought I I am. Um, probably the laziest person you will meet (laughs) like there's no one lazier than me and and I thought like I have to do something um so like when I am responsible towards others then I don't uh ever uh how to say I don't know when I'm responsible towards others I don't feel like I can um let them down or something so if I will have to need or if I will need to uh like deliver a video every week, then I will be responsible towards others. So it was kind of a way for me to study and, and learn and prepare for my, yeah, for my studies. It it keeps you on your toes. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So so (laughs) the idea for the YouTube channel, uh, was this your husband? Because, you know, you have the, the knowledge, the background in wine. And he said, Hey, you know, I think we can do something with this. No, my, it was my idea it was, as, okay. as a way to study and prepare for the like Institute of Masters of Wine and stuff like that. And and at first, I was actually thinking it and hoping it to be a bit more um, educational. And now, like he's the one who saw an opportunity and saw that people actually like it, and uh, he's the one who's trying to make it more fun um, because without him, it would be very boring or maybe made for mostly people who like are going into wine or wine very deeply. I always say wine nerds. I say it, you know, affectionately, but you know, us wine nerds who really dive into it really pretty deep. Yeah. 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 So he, he would be the one who's also kind of, no, like this is very boring. Don't talk (laughs) about clones or don't talk about, I don't know, soils or whatever. Yeah, he's like, make it more fun, and uh, yeah, so... Um, okay, I got to ask, does he have a background in, you know, videography or something? Because your set, the lighting, the editing, I mean, the sound, everything is just so well done. Uh, I'm, I'm just really impressed. No, he doesn't. He likes to joke that he's by day, like by day, he's lawyer, which he is like doing like law uh, yeah. and practicing law. And by night he's photographer and, uh, and like, he likes these things. And he, uh, it's, it's, I think for him, it's also a kind of get away from the like corporate world and, and stuff like that. Okay. So I do want to ask you, you, you've gotten into the, uh, uh, being a candidate for the master of wine. So you have your diploma through the W set right now? Yes, that I do. And so what what was your journey like in wine? I mean, everybody kind of has their story of how they got into wine or why they got into wine. 
Uh, sometimes it's just exposure, whether it be in a restaurant or, or maybe you got a job for the summer at a, at a vineyard or something like that. Some people, it's, it's a bottle of wine. You know, they had a glass of wine and, and it just kind of awed them a little bit and they went, okay, I need to learn more about this. This is fantastic. What, what's the, the journey been like for Agnes? What's the story for the love of wine? Well, actually, it started uh, when I was, um, I started to study in university and I wanted to earn myself a pocket money. Like I I didn't want to live off of my parents. So I applied for a job as a waitress and quickly they kind of, the company decided that I would uh, fit well in a very first wine bar in Riga, Latvia. At that time, uh, it was divine. And so there are two people and actually it's people who kind of, got me interested in wine. And one of them was a very good sommelier. He still is. And the way he described wine, he was describing an old wine and he was like acting with his old body and like showing like this wine is old and you know, and you cannot aerate it like so quickly or decant it like because all of that oxygen to that wine if it's 20 or 30 years old will just kill it. Like you have to be very gentle. And and the way he was describing and talking about it I was like okay that's very interesting and I like that and then another person is uh, actually quite famous currently and I work with him he's uh, Raymond Thompson's who won just uh, uh, I think a couple weeks ago the world championship Somalia world championship yeah and he saw maybe some interest in me peaking and he um, pushed me to uh compete in a local sommelier championship. And he said, and I remember, he said, if you don't know some answers to the questions, just, you know, go forward and uh, don't spend a lot of time on those questions. Answer the questions that you know. And I am answering the questions like, or not answering, but looking into the, like, the sheet of all the questions and just going from one to the other, to the third paper, the first. And I realized that I don't know answers to any of these questions (laughs) like not a single one maybe one and then I realized that if you want to compete in these like or take part in these competitions and uh, if you want to I don't know do something about it like you have to study like yeah and then I started to study and I applied for WSET in London and then I finished WSET advanced in Austria uh, and diploma in Austria, yeah, and um, and now you're a candidate for for Master of Wine, which is quite a quite an accomplishment, quite a quite a uh, uh, achievement for somebody because this is a Master of Wine. Um, it's not like you know you just study for a month or two and then go down and take the test and you're a Master of Wine. This is over the course of years for most people to uh, to finally accomplish this. Yes, yes, but uh, I'm only candidate, and uh, I don't, it, my my exam is in uh, six weeks, and I don't feel so good about it. Yeah, um, your exam is in six weeks, so you've been doing this for a few years then, preparing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, good for you. Well, I mean, I think people who have watched you or know you and see the knowledge that you have, I mean. I have confidence that you're going to be a master of wine. No, <laughs> not not close enough to what they are expecting. Really? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, that is very, very difficult uh, exam. And uh, yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm wondering, you know, I, I've done the W set. I'm, I'm just to level two. So I'm obviously don't know nearly what you know, but you know, obviously you can see the, the percentage pass fail for a lot of the different exams. Is this a, Tough one, because you hear a lot of times people talk about, you know, when you go to the quartermaster sommeliers, to pass that on your first try is very difficult. Is it similar with the W set? I mean, with the uh, Master of Wine? Is it very difficult to pass on the first test? Uh, There are a few people who have done it. And those who have not done it, or those who kind of uh, had to sit several times the exam, they always say that they have missed a lot of of the journey. Okay. Yeah, they say like that. That's not the real deal, and and uh, to be, like they're joking, of course. Sure. But I mean, yeah, there there are people who can can pass and have done it so passed uh, with the first go, 
But uh, I actually agree in some ways that uh, the studying for Masters of Wine exam, it actually is, I think a lot of fun is in that journey, how you do the people that you meet, uh, all the tastings that you uh, kind of can be part of. That's amazing. Like the wines you are able to try, like most of those wines or some of those wines I will not be able afford probably in the closest time, uh, you know, and uh, the opportunities that only being a student in the Institute of Masters of Wine is great. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Well, good luck with yeah. that. I didn't know your exam was Thank coming you. up so soon. So Yeah, June. <laughs> uh, what well, you, you do make me want to talk a little bit about, you know, women in wine, um, and especially, you know, Master of Wine. Do you know the number of women who are Masters of Wine currently? And is, do you see this number? I mean, to me, from somebody who's probably not in it as deep as you are, um, it looks like that's growing and growing women in, you know, I would say wine and spirits as well. I don't know exact numbers, but what I, what I do know uh, when it comes to Institute of Masters of Wine, the male and female is about the same level. Like, oh, good. The, like, yeah. So maybe, you know, 55, 45 or something percent, but uh, it is very balanced in that way. Uh, and uh, that's something that I'm very happy about. I, I haven't studied anything, you know, about the court masters of Somalia, but we have seen some scandalous yeah. <laughs> highlights appearing and, 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 uh, and yeah, so, uh, so I don't know. Well, what but about women, to- women in wine yeah. in general? Do you, you know, I think for a long time, at least for me, I, I always thought, you know, that world in wine, wine making things like that. Um, even in, in the world of spirits, you know, whiskey here in the States, bourbon, bourbon is just, there's a huge craze going on right now in the States for, for that beverage bourbon. And we are seeing so many big distilleries hiring women as their master distillers. And I think it's fantastic, but I'm starting to see more and more women in these types of roles as, as winemakers and things in wine as well. And I think it's great. Uh, what is your take? What are you seeing on, on women in wine? Well, I'm also, no, not also, but I'm always very happy to see a lot of women and, um, and the wine. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I can tell that, you know, like wine is better when it's made by women or by men. <laughs> but uh, I mean, in general, I like to see that more women are, are, uh, are, are going and, and reaching, you know, and, and doing stuff that they feel uh that empowers them or, I don't know, gives them pleasure in what they're doing. You know, they don't feel the stigma that I, I don't know. I, I think for when you talked about bourbon, that's very great. Like that's epic even because wine, it kind of has a bit of feminine in it, like femininity. Fem- femininity. Like feminine uh-huh. or, yeah. But like when it comes to like the, the, the hard liquor or, you know, like the spirits, then usually it's more of a, like a man's world or something. So it's, I think it's even better. I mean, for wine, I, I don't feel like that's an issue, but okay, good. not enough woman like, or there should be some, I, I don't know, at least where I'm from or uh, in my country, it's, it's not an issue. Like you're somebody a woman, so we will not hire you. I don't know. Like, not, not that they yeah. wouldn't hire them necessarily, but was there were, were they represented well? Were there enough of them doing it? You know, you know, so many times you'd go to a, a really nice restaurant, Michelin star restaurant or something. It seemed to always be in the past 15, 20 years ago, a lot of men were in the role of sommelier. Now I see so many more women in those roles. And, and just, you know, like I said, when we go to Napa and we go to wineries, you would meet the winemakers, depending on time of year you went. And uh, a lot of times it was men. 15 years ago and now it's a lot of women and I, I've been encouraged and I've liked seeing that um, I just didn't know if it was something that I'm seeing and it's been there I just hadn't noticed it before is it something that's growing women in, in these roles is growing in wine I, I think it is they are growing but we still are yet to have world champion uh, sommelier woman okay well well yeah. put, put so, that on your list Oh, there's another girl, which I, I'm, I'm very stressed uh, when it comes to like stage performance. And, and uh, yeah, but there's a girl from like Danish, Danish girl. Uh-huh. From, uh, 
and uh, Nina, and I think she's incredible. And if my colleague Raymond Thompson would have wouldn't have won, I would very much wish uh, for her to have that title. Uh, because um, what I like about her, and, I, and I'm not sure that that's the issue, not issue, but I'm not sure that's the thing with all the girls, some is, but what I like about her, I think she's more like she takes a lot of clients or customers side, like she understands what they, what they are, what they really are looking for, you know, and sometimes men can be like, okay, this is my style. This is how I like, they are more maybe, um, how to say that, like the feel customer maybe sometimes a bit more. No, uh, I, and- I get exactly what you're saying. And I think that's, that's an important part of making sure that the cu- the customer's happy at the end is making sure they get what they want, not what you think might be yeah. the best with that dish. No, that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. And like the empathy, I think maybe sometimes they, like, like women can have when they work on the floor much better. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, but I don't want to eff- offend anyone. So <laughs> no, maybe not someone at all. Thinks differently. <laughs> no, I think women have a, a lot of, you know, character traits that are different and, and, and you know, better for, for some of those things. You know, empathy being one of them, patience being another one, you know, to, to let somebody <laughs> take the time and understand and li- listen and answer questions and things like that. Sometimes us men are, are you know, come on, come on, come on, you know, make a decision. So <laughs> women, women do a lot better at that as well. Um, I do want to ask you about ladies and, you know, as far as influencers, when I, when I look around other social media platforms, whether it be Instagram or TikTok or something like that, I seem to see a lot of ladies, uh, doing wine content there, but on YouTube, I don't seem to see them as much. And this is kind of a question. I don't know that you have the answer for it, but I don't, I don't understand. Maybe I'm not finding the ladies on YouTube in their channels and what they're doing, but I just don't see them coming through the algorithm to me as much. And maybe it's a different type of platform, you know, that, that they're just comfortable or like doing the TikTok kind of thing or the Instagram kind of thing. But I'd like to see more ladies doing YouTube and wine. YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I think the issue is not necessarily that, um, that they are more comfortable with pictures or with short term, like short videos, uh-huh. uh, what is in TikTok. But I think in general, in on YouTube, you have less wine influencers or wine YouTubers. So there are very little uh, number of us. Um, uh, so, and there's Wine Folly as well, uh, which yes, we, I like uh, her. Madeline. Yeah, and she's very, very strong. So I think that is the reason. That's just we are very l- limited number on YouTube, and that's it. And I, I expect there will be more, and people, more people will, will, will come on board, and maybe you know, uh, start to make these uh, longer videos, uh, educational videos about wine. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your, your, as you go through this education and let's, you know, fingers crossed, you you get your master's uh, of wine. Um, What's the long-term goal for for Agnes with wine? What do you want to do in the world of wine? Or do you know yet? Um, For the longest time, it was uh, making wine. Um, I was thinking, in Latvia, we don't, like, we can work with hybrids. Or maybe, yeah, with some fruit wine or, or stuff like that. We cannot really make uh, wine from Vitis vinifera wines, unfortunately. They cannot uh, sustain or, like, they, they cannot live in our climate. So for the longest time, I was thinking that I would like to travel to Italy and or move to Italy, like this romantic, uh, girly dream and uh, and make wine there because I've always been fascinated by this like the stuff that like the soil and how like our soil our planet gives us or you know food gives us uh, wine as well you know and and uh, gives us so many things from a little seed you know to to the fruit so I always wanted to work in the winery and in the vineyards nowadays I'm not so sure I don't know um yeah yeah so we'll we'll just see how the road kind of goes for agnes and see what happens yeah but okay. yeah winery is still always an option because that's um i think that's that could be good um let's talk just education in general 
what you know obviously for some people who are into wine uh, you you need the education. You need to do the W set or you know the the Psalm. I forget what that one's called. The the Guild Psalm Guild or I forget what that's called. Um, or the you know Court of Master Sommeliers if you want to work in a restaurant or something like that. But what do you think about wine education for just the the consumer? You know me, I just consider myself just a consumer. But uh, at the urging of a friend of mine who's a de- deployed WSET grad, he, he was like, you know, you love wine. You like to talk about wine. You should start to, you know, do some of these things. I think you would appreciate it more. And he was absolutely right. The more uh, I learned about wine through education, through the WSET, uh, it's really enhanced my enjoyment, my experience with drinking wine and, and sharing wines with friends when they come over. What's your thought on the consumer, you know, kind of, dipping their toes in the pool, so to speak, uh, on learning more about wine from an education standpoint? Yeah, I mean, first, you don't have to have an education to work in a restaurant as a sommelier. A lot of people don't. Um, it's, it's very important to have a skill of a communicator, like that you can communicate and you feel comfortable. And then, of course, a lot of is self-study, actually. Uh, and you kind of have to know or not have to know but like you have to know your wine list not necessarily all the world so yeah it's of course better that you have some education behind as well but when it comes for people uh regular wine drinkers wine lovers i mean education whatever is it in wine or i don't know chemistry or, or what whatever kind of education is always welcome i think you know you kind of know uh you just become better yourself you develop yourself in a way and i don't think uh it is something you should not not necessarily kind of the, the fear or decide you know oh now i like wine so i need to study or 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 the opposite so i'm not yeah, I, I would say that education in general is a good thought, you know, and as we grow older, like wine is not something you can start to st- start to study in your like school <laughs> uh, when you're six or seven years old. Yeah. As we grow older, you know, when we and we have other educations behind our like, you know, back and we already kind of. Uh, we can start to study something that we like. And if wine happens to be something that you like, why not do that? I agree. It can only be better. I mean, nothing bad can come out of it, I guess. <laughs> totally agree. We're, we're lucky here in Houston that we have uh, the Texas Wine School who, you know, is accredited to be able to, you know, teach the W set and other things. And they do some some fun things. You know, I really like that you can have a girl's night and you can, you know, schedule with them and go down and, and do a class with the girls uh, on Italian wines, or you could do it on Napa, or, you know, you could do a, a, a team building event from your work and do it through wine, you know, going down and, and doing a class on whatever you want to do with wine. They'll custom build, you know, classes. They'll, they'll do whatever you want. And, and I just think that's a way if it, to me, a lot of people who don't know that this is out there for them to kind of, get into it's hard for them you know you don't know what you don't know but i think it's great that the texas wine school is doing this and anytime i get the opportunity to promote it and let people know it's available for them to kind of go experience i always try to do that because i just think learning about wine if you enjoy drinking it to me every time agnes i have a glass and it's something i enjoy i want to know where did it come from who made it how do they do it you know i want to learn more about what i have in the glass and the schools kind of help you understand what you're what you're getting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I think what what also schools help, or at least for me they did, is uh, there's so much information about wine. Oh my god! Like you, I don't think I will ever ever kind of stop studying about wine. But um, what school specifically WSET also helps is that they kind of give you structure where to put all that knowledge in and how to then work with it and how to maybe talk and describe wine as well. So that is good because otherwise you just study a little bit about, I don't know, this wine region in Chile and then, oh, there's some other wine region in Argentina and then, oh, it's something similar, you know, here in Spain. And then it's, yeah, I mean, you can get lost and uh, sometimes these... uh, 
these schools, these education programs actually help you to gather all that information, put that in the shelves, and then kind of work with that. Yeah, and the other thing I liked about the W set is its classroom environment. You know, whether you're in a place like here where I can go in and actually do it in person in classroom, or, you know, I know the Texas Wine School now does it, uh, you know, through through Zoom or something like that, where if you're doing it online, it's still, you know, the video has allowed people to kind of have still a little bit of that sense of being in the classroom with the group. I think group learning is is so great, and I love that the W set does that because, uh, you know, there's so many times people will bring up something or ask a question I wouldn't have thought of, and it just helps me continue to gain information from, from you know, some of my classmates or something like that. So I, I love that aspect of the W set. Yeah, and you also get to have or meet new people to share your interest with, with you know. and um, That's that's a great point, too. And, and in the classroom, you also yeah. get to drink wine. <laughs> You're tasting yeah. so much. You know what else I have found? Uh, maybe you you haven't seen it. I don't know. But I think that wine lovers, they are, they always like to share their wine bottles, no matter how expensive it is. Like they will, they don't want to drink it alone. They always want to share it with someone. And then if you know something about wine, then they will want to share it with you, you know? Oh, absolutely. I I say that all the time. I mean, nobody wants to enjoy a great bottle by themselves. And if you, my wife and I, every weekend, I love to host dinners and I love to cook and open bottles of wine or, or share bourbon. Uh, and I always tell people the food and the wine is just a way to get people here. Uh, you know, because ultimately I want to enjoy the company. And when you're drinking a great, great glass of wine to experience that with a good friend or, or somebody in the family that also enjoys it, there's just nothing better. And it's a great memory, right? 10 years from now, you remember, you remember when we drink that bottle? Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, are you ready to talk a little bit about the wine world and wines in general? Let's do it. <laughs> I recently did an episode where we talked about uh, a friend of mine and and I came up with five uh, AVAs or regions, or it could be a country if it were a smaller country, that we kind of called underappreciated. And kind of the criteria we put on it was, you know, they make really good wine, but for whatever reason, people might know about them or maybe they don't know about this, this region or this appellation. And uh, there's good value there as well. Do you have any regions that you go, man, this is great wine, and it's just, you know, underappreciated. People aren't enjoying this wine as much as they should be. Well, I make a lot of videos about that, I guess. Um, Well, definitely Austria uh, as a whole country. Um, They make amazing wines uh, of the highest quality, and most of those wines actually don't leave Austria. Uh, so they are locally very happy as well. They're drinking very high quality wine. Um, then I would say still wines of Portugal. And these wines definitely uh, offer great value. I mean, they are practically throwing those wines away for very little money. And uh, it's our job to just catch those w- bottles. It's amazing. And they also have a lot of great local grape varieties that uh, you can discover. I mean, red and white grape wines. I think Greece. Oh. Yeah. I, I think that Greece is a winemaking country that is about to become big. Okay. Uh, and about to become very uh, trendy and very, like, stylish to enjoy and they also can be very proud of with a lot of local uh native grape varieties that we don't know like i i was just editing a wine list that i did and there was this wine grape variety that i just i didn't even know how to pronounce like it's uh it's it's great so yeah these uh three would be maybe uh those European are good ones wine company. yeah i think oh well, i i, I, I wanna, think they are i, I, I really do I want to ask your opinion on the Portugal one, because I have seen that. I think a lot of times, at least here in the States, to some degree, um, Americans will uh, kind of equate quality to a certain amount of price, right? If we see a bottle of wine, you know, for me, I might say my floor for, for what could be a quality bottle of wine might be around $15, 
you know. Uh, but I see some of these Portugal steel wines that can be 10 bucks here. And so I, I'm asking you, is it fair to say that even if you see them that low, they can still be great wines? And so we should, to your point, gobble them up. They're giving them away. Because I think a lot of times people go, 10 bucks. I'm not buying. It can't be good for 10 bucks. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be a bit difficult for me to answer because I'm not sure how the pricing or, or, or markup works in, 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 in the United States. But there have been uh, great wines that I had tasted from Portugal, red wines, for, for example, for, uh, from um, the wholesale price would be something around five euros, which is equivalent to five dollars. Wow! So and that's wholesale price. So a bit higher, six, seven in 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 my local shop, and those wines for that price. Of course, they are not the same quality as you would have like for hundred dollars, but for that price, you couldn't ask for anything more. Like there's concentration, there's good enough complexity, you know, and it sits on the palate for long enough and it kind of shows, gives you this beautiful aftertaste, uh, bright, lovely fruit, nothing overcooked, you know, or something. Yeah. And uh, great wines. Yeah, I always say I like to try to find a wine that uh, punches up. You know, I might pay 10 bucks for it, or e even if I paid 30 bucks for it, to drink it and go, that's that's great at 30. I would have paid 50 for that easy. And so it sounds like yeah. these Portuguese wines uh, might be these. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, I also they, want to yeah, ask you, great value. That, that would probably be a value region because that's my next question. Where, where are some value regions where you think you get some great wines where people don't really, is, might not be on their radar yet? You know, like for me, I always come back to Chile. I think Chile and Argentina are two regions that are great. Uh, for value Definitely. to quality, what you're getting. Do you have a couple that you might throw in there? Yeah, Chile and Argentina definitely uh, are value regions uh, or value winemaking countries. Uh, Portugal, again, I would say. Um, let me think what else. I think Spain, like it, it is a very traditional winemaking country. Like everyone thinks about Spain when we talk about wine. But I think Spain offers great value for sure. And maybe some southern part regions in Italy as well. Not necessarily Sicily, but like, you know, the, the mainland of Italy, southern regions. Yeah. Yes. Um, what else? South Africa, I guess, also. But yeah, Chile and Argentina, definitely, I think, way more. Yeah. Have you ever had a, a Riesling from the Finger Lakes here in the States? No, I'm actually currently looking for one. Are you because, really? Uh, I want to, yeah, I want to taste it before my exam <laughs> just to kind of know and and uh, and have the idea of it. Okay, well, we will... Uh, Unfortunately. I'll chat with you after the, <laughs> we finish this. But no, that's a region that I think is uh, still has great value and great quality. And, and it's not one, you know, even here in the States, everybody always goes to California and Napa, which rightfully so, they, they make great wines. Uh, they, they have gotten very, very expensive. But I think when you look at a, a quality wine ranking region that is underappreciated but has great value. The Finger Lakes is one that always kind of jumps up to me. And a, a lot of people even here in the States don't even think about getting wine from there. But once they're exposed to it, they go, wow, this is this is fantastic. So I didn't know if you'd ever had one from there. Unfortunately, no. But uh, I think I ha someone even commented for me, like in the YouTube channel, just to, you definitely have to try it. Amazing value, amazing yeah. uh, quality. And what is the average price of these wines? Do you know? Well, I mean, obviously, like any region, they can get expensive. But the average, I would say you're, you're between 12 and $18. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. For American wine, that's very yeah. affordable. Yeah. Very. Now, there's some producers that have some, you know, higher end ones that can get up to twenty five, thirty five dollars. But uh, uh, yeah, for the most part, you can get a, a great Riesling from that area for, uh, you know, 12 to 20 bucks. Easy. OK, OK. No, I, I have to find it. It's uh, very difficult to, to actually find in Europe and my small country as well. <laughs> I'll see if I can't help you out. You never know. <laughs> okay. Um, let me ask you this. I always, I always talk to people about wine and, you know, being a wine 
drinker and lover, it's, it, part of that is exploring, right? Going all around the world, trying all the different things you, you want to expose yourself to. But there's always that time where it's like, okay, tonight I want a wine and I want to open something that I know I'm absolutely going to love and enjoy. And so I have a couple of regions that I'm going to pull from. And probably number one for me would be Brunello. That's where I'm going to go for my kind of my bottle that I know I'm just going to absolutely sit back, relax, and enjoy. What's uh, one or two regions that when you have to go home and, and have a bottle that you know you're not going to be disappointed with or let down, what region do you like to go to? My answer will be very, very um predictable maybe in a way for wine lovers champagne oh. <laughs> champagne is definitely my go-to when i don't want to be disappointed when i want to celebrate something or when i feel like you know i deserve it but if we are kind of take let's just take champagne out of the picture for a while then it's of course barolo or barbaresco okay. so i'm right next to you in italy and then uh, Austrian whites, especially Grunerwald Liner, is a grape that I love and uh, I know I always will enjoy. So that's a wine that I love, the Gruner. Uh, Grunerwald Liner, we don't see it as much here, as I, at least in our market here in Houston, as, as I wish I could because I, I love that grape. Are there other indigenous white grapes in, in Austria that maybe some of us don't know about that you enjoy? Uh, my uh, might be, yeah, there are a few, um, but they are very, very small, very little production. Um, hmm. I'm just thinking um, something that pops into my mind right away. Yeah, not, not, nothing that really kind of I okay. think you could find. Yeah, because um, when, when I think about Germany, I think about, you know, uh, Riesling being there, obviously, but then you, you get into some of the reds, which is, I forget what they call Pinot Noir. In, Sorry, in uh, Germany? Yeah. Pinot Noir? Ger yeah. What, don't they call it something else? Spot something? Oh, uh, um, uh, Spätburgunder. Yeah, that's what it is. So I didn't know if there was yeah. something similar, like, you know, because... Yeah, yeah. You get back to, in America, you know, when you read a label, it always says pretty much the, the great variety is going to be on the label where when you go to old world countries, for the most part, you need to know the region to know what grape they're using in that region. So it's, it's always interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this. Is there, is there something in wine that you're most excited about coming up in the next year, two years, five years? Um, besides your, your own journey in the world of wine as a whole, do you see it on an upward trend? You know, is, are things going? Because I saw Matthew Horky, I don't know if you saw his recent video, and it was titled, Is Wine Doomed? And, and he, he did a, a fun job. And I know I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, uh, articles written about, you know, the younger generation is not drinking wine, you know, like in decades past, and they're, they're you know, the wine industry as a whole is, you know, tough roads ahead. And I don't know that I believe that for me. Uh, when I grew up, I'm obviously quite a bit older than you. Uh, nobody drank wine in their 20s or 30s. It was thought to be the, you know, a more of a classy kind of, uh, you know, it was a, a wealthier person's beverage to enjoy. And to me, over the last 15 years, I think the wine industry as a whole has done a great job kind of getting the younger generations to uh, try wine and stay in the wine world, become, you know, kind of, I call it, uh, you know, addicted to wine. You, you, you kind of start drinking it and you can't get away from it. Um, and I see so many friends and, and people that are in their 20s and 30s enjoying wine now, and I never saw that 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I don't think wine is doomed. I mean, it has been around for like, Several thousand years, I guess. Um, yeah. And so I think we're good. Uh, of course, there are some, uh, you know, ups and downs and, and, and things change. But, I mean, it's all good. The um, trend, trends that I'm looking into or, uh, you know, um, it will be controversial. But I think I hope to see more higher quality low uh, alcohol wines or no alcohol wines 
And uh, because I do, you know, wine ultimately is alcohol and we have to be careful about that. It is a drug and uh, it can, you know, be addictive. Sure. Well, I think it makes sense to maybe limit your uh, alcohol intake or maybe be aware of how much you are actually drinking and understand what that means. And But when we talk about wine, for most of the people who love wine, alcohol is actually very little of that pleasure. And the story itself, the legend, how it smells, the flavors, you know, on the palate, how it feels, that plays a lot of... Uh, that kind of, I don't know, plays a lot of importance when it comes or sometimes even more than alcohol itself. So you don't necessarily drink wine to just get wasted or tipsy or, you know, it, it is just totally nice agree. Yeah. side effect. So if for those people who would like to still enjoy wine, but would like to limit their intake, alcohol intake, it makes sense that we develop in the wine industry of uh, developed wines with lower alcohol, seven, five, you know, four, eight uh, degrees of alcohol or no alcohol at all. And uh, so that could give you, give maybe broader uh, range. I don't know. I, I like that idea because you see it in the world of beer. I mean, the, the world of beer has had non-alcoholic beer for, for quite a long time. And I know a lot of people who uh, take part in that because they enjoy beer. Yeah, exactly. So and, I do want to know, ask you, when we talk about a lower alcohol wine, you know, those of us who may have uh, kind of learned this know that a lot of times it's a sweeter wine if it's a lower alcohol because there's that residual sugar in there. Are you talking more about making a more dry wine with a lower alcohol? Yeah, oh, completely I like that. dry. Yeah, so not sometimes, you know, lower alcohol wine would also be like, there's option one that you just kind of arrest the fermentation and there's residual sugar left there. So you have to like deal with that. And then you have to add a lot of, you know, then you have to st sterile filter or add a lot of sulfide. So the wine is stable, but then there's another issue when sometimes it's just, you use all the best wine you have for your top cuvées and top labels. And then there's something left and then you use it for, you know, whatever, or you can make like an entry level wine. And then maybe it's lower alcohol, it's lower quality, or you dilute it or whatever. And then, you know, you kind of add sugar to hide it all, the quality you kind of to make it, I don't know, bubbly and look at nice, bubbly, not in a taste way, but right. you know, look nice. So it fits. Uh, the picture, but I mean, high, good, high or very good quality wine, dry wine made for people who are looking maybe to limit their alcohol intake or, you know, yeah, but still would like to enjoy wine. Well, I think that would be good. I, I love the idea because, you know, we, we, to your point that you made earlier, we monitor how much we drank because we don't want the effect of the wine. I don't want to get tipsy. And I don't drink wine for the alcohol. A lot of times I drink wine and not have a bourbon because it is lower in alcohol. Um, and I would, I say that to say, I would love to be able to drink a higher volume of wine over the course of an evening to enjoy different things without the effect. So I could just have a great time. So yeah. I love the idea, Agnes. I think it's great. Yeah. Well, there are a few products uh, in the market and uh, more and more people are, or you know, engineers or whatever, I don't know, are looking into how to create that and how to increase wine's quality uh, without alcohol yeah, or very little alcohol in it. You're yeah. the first one who I've heard mention this, and I think it's a great idea. I hadn't even thought about it. So that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's something, that's a trend that also could be uh, more popular in the future as well. So well, I, I want. I hope so. Oh, I, I think it. I think it probably will be because why not? I mean, they're doing it in other, you know, spirits and things. I mean, you can get cocktails that we we call mocktails with no alcohol, right? So you can still kind of have yeah. that. Why not in wine? You know, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I want to ask you if you were putting together. You had a friend that said he or she said. I want to start kind of building a little wine collection at home. You know, right now I go to the store, I buy a bottle, I drink a bottle. And I want to start with 12 bottles. What would be the varieties that you might 
put in that case for that person? What would be, if you're going to expose them to some wines and you say start with 12, whites and reds, I'm guessing there might be one champagne in there. What would it be? Well, my question would be, if you want to collect wine, then why you want it? Why you want to collect it? Like, is it investment? Do you want never like, investment? To sell I, it? Nah, drink it. No. Yeah, no for drinking. Drinking well, and that- I, and I want to say exploring. I, I'll throw that in as, as quite part of the criteria because a lot of times, you know, people uh, they always they might say, "I know what I like," right? And and do they really? Because they've only been drinking this, and, and until you can kind of get them to try something else, they go. Well, hold on a second. I thought I only liked this, but that was kind of good too. So with the idea of I want to expose them to some things as well to, to get them to try some things. Okay. Well, again, I would ask a few more <laughs> questions like what is the style they like or, or what is that they know that they like. You it's know? an open book. Start, this, this is start from that. Yeah. <laughs> but if, uh, if it's like just I can suggest or yeah. I can put whatever in that box, then mm-hmm. uh, I would put few Rieslings probably. Uh, okay. I think Germany, Mosel, and definitely Austria as well. I would put Chardonnay oh, yeah. from Burgundy. Um, I would put maybe uh, also some Chablis there and kind of to, to just to see, because there's a lot of people who say I don't like Chardonnay. And then like, that's, that's not correct. Like yeah. you probably, there is a Chardonnay that you would like in the world. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, so a few bottles of Chardonnay from classical regions, but although Brunello uh, might, might go there, definitely vintage Champagne, especially if you are looking into uh, aging those wines. Bordeaux, I think, would be interesting as a classic region, and Burgundy, if you can afford that, yeah. or, you know, a few bottles that, that you can afford that are able to withstand some time. When it comes to New World, I do like Australian reds a lot. So I would probably put either Barossa or or Cunovara uh, wines in there. I would put maybe some Napa as well. Okay. <laughs> I, I was wondering uh, if I you might go there. Yeah. R- ridiculously expensive, yes. but I do like those wines. And um, what else? I am currently in love in one uh, within one Malbec from El Enemigo, so I would maybe put oh. it there as well. Okay, do I, think... I have twelve? Because there's a lot of wines I could put in. <laughs> well, no, no, that, that that it doesn't have to be twelve different ones. It was just you know what it would comprise of. So you you've named enough that you can make a case out of that for sure. Yeah, yeah I think... and I could continue. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great. I, I do want to. You you got back to when we talked about you know. Your, your happy place in wine, and you mentioned champagne, but, you know, you kind of went away from that and said, I'll, I'll go to Barolo. And, but let me ask you about champagne. Where did that come from, your love of champagne? And because a lot of people, and me included, it took me a long time. You know, I thought champagne was just a celebratory drink. I thought it was just for special occasions. I thought it was pretty much the same thing in every bottle. Uh, this was me getting into wine and trying to learn about it. I didn't know. And come to find out, it's all of that is 180 degrees wrong, right? It's it's everything uh, the opposite of that. It's so great. It's so diverse. There's so many different styles. Um, it's a great food wine. It probably shouldn't be drunk with you know dessert <laughs> uh, for the most part. Uh, things like that. So where did your love of champagne come from? I don't know. And and I mean, I would have asked you back, like. Who doesn't love champagne? Yeah. Because I literally think that everyone enjoys and it's such a great uh, drink. You know, it, it it offers just this everyday, I don't know, it kind of makes and lifts every day, you know, higher and, and makes, yeah, kind of, uh, it seems, the day seems or evening seems better when you have a glass of champagne. It's just, it's it's great. And I like, you know, of course, because of the, bubbles or uh, CO2, not CO, SO, no, CO2. CO2, uh-huh. Like, yeah, it gives you immediate buzz a yeah. little bit. You know, you kind of, like, it takes stress away of a long day. But then, you know, it is also so complex on the nose. And it's it 
like next to these immediate fruits and stuff like that, you also have that winemaking and you have these brioche notes and you have freshly baked bread, you know, and, and it tells a lot of story. There's also a great history behind it. So every single champagne house or winemaker or grower, they have this amazing stories to tell about how they became who they are. I mean, it is, uh, I think it overall is a very good, and, and in general, the quality is very, very high. Yes. I mean, you can get the cheapest champagne, which is still very expensive if you compare with other wines. Uh, but like still the quality is in general very, very high. So, yeah, I don't yeah. know. I think that's a beautiful wine. Yeah, I, I, I love champagne now. A friend of mine and uh, a, a co-host on another show that we do, uh, he wrote a book on champagne and he, uh, he was the one who got me kind of into it and learned a little bit more about it. And I had no idea for the longest time that it was such a great food wine. And he was the one who kind of exposed me to it. And that's the, been the biggest thing to the, you know, the friends and people I know who had the same thoughts of, as me of champagne. It was just kind of a, a drink on its own or a celebratory drink or something like that. It's not, you know, having it with food, pairing it with food and, and deliberately doing that is you know, not only okay, it, it, it should be done more often, probably. Yeah, and there are specific foods that I think are wine killers, but champagne can deal greatly with, like, yeah, definitely. I want to ask you about uh, something I've also come to love here recently and, and diving more into, which is fortified wines. Are you a fan? I am. I do like, and I think they are under um, appreciated. Yeah. Especially now nowadays, when people are really looking into the like alcoholic strength of the wine, and then when they see, oh, it's twenty, uh, then oh no, no, I will not drink it. But you just don't know what you're missing out. Those uh, wines can be very, very complex. Yeah, Madeira and ports. I, I've just come to really enjoy those, and, and they're absolutely delicious. And I like that you know, if I want to open a bottle and have a sip, it can last for quite a long time after being open. So it's it's a big benefit to having a bottle like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. great, great wine. Yeah, and can be had with food. A lot of people don't think that as well. You know, um, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you: Going into the summer, are you a rosé lady? Do you do you enjoy rosé? Is it something you drink? Very little, to okay. be honest. Um, very little. Um, hmm, it's di- it's difficult. I usually I'm not a fan of like these very fruit bomb and fresh and zesty like yeah ultra aromatic wines. I usually like something more quiet and, and uh, yeah, the, so, and most of roses usually fall into that very aromatic fruit bomb type uh, with limited complexity. Not to say that there are none, no great rose wines, there are, but um, yeah. Okay, I've never been a big rosé guy, and a friend of mine is telling me that he's going to get me to to enjoy these, and that's why I was asking. I thought, well, I wonder if Agnes is going to be on board with the the rosé kind of, you know, rosé all day. You can have it all year round, you know, whatever. It's a great wine. I've just never, I don't know, it just never kind of jumped up and made me go, I want to drink these. Uh, and I didn't know, you know, from a profile standpoint, from the white to the, you know, the the short contact with the skins, what should I be getting from, I mean, it, you know, because it's not a red, it's not a white. What, I, I just didn't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and one, one more thing that Rose is, they usually are fermented in a very low temperature and well, some people like it. I don't, I mean, the higher fermentation temperature, the more complexity wine offers. Uh. And uh, yeah. So, and then they are very bon bon, like sweet fruit type of uh, wines, and uh, they all become very similar to at some point yeah. to each other. I don't. It's it's. It sounds like I'm generalizing and hating on rosé wine, but that's not true. It's just uh, I have to look very carefully to find a good rosé. Well, and that's that's yeah. that's what makes the world of wine great. I think we all have palates, and they're all different. And so not that they're not good wines, they just don't hit with me or hit with you. And, and that's fine. I think that's what makes the, 
yeah. the world go around. We all, we all enjoy different things and there's something made for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So what are summer wines? When, when you have a hot day and you're sitting out back, I mean, I, I'm assuming it's probably going to be a white of some type, but do you have some favorite wines that you enjoy, you know, when you're sitting around with friends and family on, on, on a summer day? I mean, I will go again with the usual suspects, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the Gruner Waldliner or Rieslings. Okay. Uh, but in, in summertime, especially Rieslings, because this is a grape that does not develop high alcohol levels. So in summer, you don't want to have like very like high alcohol or warming sensation on the palate. So it's a very good uh, wine to choose. I mean, yeah. you know, and uh, Sauvignon Blanc sometimes but Riesling is usually, and it's so crisp and, you know, whatever you're doing or like fresh salad or having something on the next to the grill, then it also works well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Agnes, thank you so much for, for doing this and having a conversation with me today. I've really, really enjoyed it. I hope so. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, it's been you. a lot of fun. And, and I have no doubt that the folks listening have enjoyed it as well. And again, if you haven't subscribed or went and found Agnes on YouTube, definitely do that. Agnes, where else are you on social media? I, I know I see you on Instagram and follow you there as well. Yes, I am also on Instagram as Blanc de Noir. Um, so it's champagne term that we use and uh, I'm, I'm not like super active but yeah I am there so find her on YouTube for sure you'll enjoy the videos you put it out I think it's every Sunday it's every Sunday yeah. yes so well thanks everybody for listening to this episode of food wine and whiskey and until our next episode enjoy your next pour <laughs>